Hello and welcome everyone. This is our new session of our TV pilot uh, boot camp program for Script Camp that's going to take you from idea to finished draft of a brand new pilot in just over the course of uh, this six week program. Plus we have this extra bonus day here at the beginning that's going to give you an overview of the course and a little time to get those gears turning on what your project is going to be and how you're going to start breaking it down and explaining it and just getting those basic things out of the way before you move into more serious pre-writing and outlining. Um, so thanks for joining us. This is a live interactive class. So if you're on Discord, you can participate by asking questions that will be able to show up in our little stream chat right here. Um, if you are watching on one of our other channels, then thanks for joining us. Make sure if you want to be in these classes to sign up for Script Camp and to hop over on our Discord channel. So just go to scriptcamp.net. That's where you can sign up and also get that link to join our stream. Um, let's look at the overview here and just a, a little bit of information about uh, Script Camp itself. So again, remember to keep your microphones muted during class by clicking that small gray microphone icon in the bottom left corner of the screen. If you need to unmute yourself, you just need to click that one more time. You can right click on any other user in the Discord to adjust their user volume. There's a, a couple more tips and things on audio troubleshooting, so just rewind your stream to this slide if you want to see some more uh, troubleshooting suggestions here if you're having trouble being seen or heard. Um, or sorry, I should say speaking or being heard. So what is Script Camp? We are a screenwriting community that's focused on the bedrock of these classes. We have a couple classes a week, both free classes and paid ones that are meant to generally help you go from idea to completed script, no matter the type of script you're writing, whether that is a feature or a pilot or a novel manuscript or a play. Um, we have different classes that serve, serve all of these different um, needs and we are adding new stuff all the time. A lot of focus in very specified genres nowadays. We have guests. We do interviews. Um, we have a lot of different um, things you can do here to just get better at writing. This is, I describe this like a gym that you go to to get better at writing. So um, we have some of these are free. And then we have other ones that are paid and VIP classes, such as the remainder of the boot camp after today. So if you want to stay in this boot camp, you'll have to sign up either to buy the course on its own or to be a an unlimited member, meaning you have access to all of our courses and everything we do here. So make sure you sign up on scriptcamp.net if you want to be in any classes past this first intro. Um, a little about me. My name's Connor. I teach the boot camps and weekly writers lab, which is like office hours on Saturdays where you can come and get additional one on one help on whatever it is that you're working on. I've been writing full length scripts since uh, I left high school about 11 years ago, moved to L.A. in 2015 with no connections, got signed two years later for the first time off my historical horror adventure script. I've since written on Shudder's Creepshow. I do a lot of rewrites on smaller horror and thriller um, for, for horror and thriller production companies in town in L.A. And I have a recent thriller script that has been set up with a major production company. So there's some info there on there. I'm not going to read everything, but that's just a little about me. Um, and here's just a couple of the things that we have at Script Camp. We have these three main boot camps. That's Feature, TV, and our rotating Saturday slot, which we've gone through science fiction. We've gone through um, playwriting for six weeks. We've had many different uh, rotating things in that one day, which is Saturdays from 12 to 2. Our most recent boot camp in that slot is boot, short film boot camp, which is Saturdays from 12 to 2 for the next four weeks. You will write an entire short film between one and 10 pages from beginning to end. Two rounds, including uh, like feedback and revision. So if you're just getting started and want to work on something smaller, tomorrow's 12 to 2 class is probably a great place to go. Um, feature boot camp, this is going to be Sundays at 11, starting uh, day after tomorrow. So this brand new session of feature class will be running for eight weeks starting um, this upcoming weekend. And then we have Pilot Boot Camp. That's this one you're in now. That will be this time slot, Fridays from 5 to 7 o'clock Pacific time um, for the next six weeks. Um, Novel Boot Camp starts on Saturday, September 17th, and that will be that Saturday noon slot. We have many other um, classes and groups that you can see over here on the right, and you can start your own group if you have some particular genre or specialty or something that you want to discuss and be trading and workshopping and things like that. So let us know if you want to actually start one of these, but you can just get a, a brief glimpse at some of the many different um, meetings that happen weekly here um, on the server. So what are the boot camps? We are going to take you from idea to finished draft, um, you know, using this step-by-step -step practical method with weekly meetings. So each meeting is two hours. It's like college style class. So you show up once a week, you're not, there's no attendance taken, there's no grades or anything like that, but this is just like going to the gym to write an entire script and move on to the next one and do this and get better and better as you iterate and learn and improve as you go. So these are two hour classes. We have eight weeks, so the eight class meetings for features starting um, on, our, or sorry, eight week meetings for the feature starting in the upcoming program, which is going to be on Sunday. 
six weeks for stage play, which we don't have a currently active class running, but we have videos of that one. We had uh, we've done many rewrite boot camps as well, and we're trying to get another one started. So if you have any interest, please let us know. But um, we've done four weeks for that, four weeks for our pitch boot camp, which we had a bunch of great guests for, and then we did a horror thriller boot camp on Saturdays as well. Um, recordings of all of these are available to members. Um, let's look at the schedule for this class or for this course. So week zero is going to be on. Just the absolute ground level basics of what is a pilot and why do you write one and um, how do I kind of write one. And you're going to start figuring out the idea of what do you actually want to work on for the next eight weeks. So you don't have to have that idea actually solid right now, but today's class is a good time to start feeling out what it is that you're going to want to write and to start to assemble maybe the first couple pieces of organizational information that will help you figure out what that story is going to be. And that might be, you know, you have you come out with a version of a log line which is one sentence that's going to describe the story to, to us and tell us sort of who is the main character, what are they trying to do, that sort of thing. Um, you really have to have that finalized at the end of next week, in next week's class, but don't worry too much um, if you don't get that in, you know, rock solid today. You just want to start thinking about these things and start to organize your thoughts because many of us have a bunch of very scattered ideas or maybe you have 10 notebooks that are filled with scribbles or whatever it is that you do. Many of us just don't have really solid ideas completely succinctly presented so that's what these first couple classes are just to really help you figure out what am i writing what is it supposed to be what is the general trajectory of it what is that first episode going to look like and how do i sort of imply what this might be from week to week not that i'm actually going to get a tv show but i'm going to write a pilot with the assumption that i want to um you know create a story that feels like it is the launching off point for theoretically years of entertainment um so that's why pilots are weird pilots are this whole kind of self-contained strange art form where you have to get used to writing a bunch of these things expecting you're not going to get a tv show you're fundamentally writing a bunch of incomplete stories a pilot is an incomplete story or it's part of an incomplete you know it is a sample of what would be a theoretical larger story so you can't think oh I, i'm gonna really pay this off and bring this home in season three or in episode eight you're only gonna get a pilot you're not going to get more episodes and nobody's going to read beyond a pilot so that means we have to approach pilots with you know a sense of unique uh, challenges and difficulties that come with telling an incomplete sort of unfinished story. I guess maybe you can think of it this way. It's incomplete, but it's not unfinished. The pilot itself needs to feel like it has that str strong beginning, middle, and end, and it has given us a representative sample of what this larger un uh, you know, non-complete work would be. Um, but it still feels satisfying on its own right, and it still feels like I don't regret watching this and I, I feel like I've gotten the same sort of experience I might get from a short movie in, the, in that we feel satisfied and maybe we have some questions that are left at the end but we feel like this has concluded either the first chapter of a longer narrative or one example of a mini type of like a mini example of what the rest of the show would be many many versions of so that's sort of the two formats we can talk more about today that sort of status quo based continuity or the longer more um, consistent continuity you can work on either one but for the purposes of the class you are a little bit incentivized to write something that is simpler and shorter because you only have six weeks to do it you if you're picking between half hour and hour you're deciding do i want to write um 60 pages or half that much so if you have multiple ideas you're trying to pick from especially if you're just new and starting out this you want to pick one that will be simpler and easier to do we'll get more into that in just a minute let me just finish going over the rest of this schedule here so week one why the story so you're figuring out why am i picking this and it could be something as simple as that's just really cool plus maybe you have the reason why this is relevant universally or relevant now or something like that but when you're just practicing it's less important to have super thematically relevant scripts that are so blindingly original that no one's ever done them before it's a little more important to just be writing something finishing it and moving on to the next thing because those are the skills that are always going to be that's your primary thing to work on um writing and finishing and moving on um so we're not going to worry too much if we end up with masterpieces and at the end of week one why the story you don't have to have some mind-blowingly original incredible reason why you're working on this but it's just to figure out sort of the essentials of what am i making and what is my general approach here week two is on outlining those broad strokes those story beat summary is going to be like a list of all the major events of, the, of your narrative that are in the general shape and order that they must occur in but you don't need to include every single scene that will show up in the whole thing Outlining two is when you're going to really expand that story beat summary into a full paragraph for every single scene so that you will know what is supposed to happen on every page before you even write a single word. So we don't actually do any dialogue writing or any scene blocking or anything like that until halfway through the program. You're going to spend this whole first half of this entire course planning and figuring out what is my show, what is the premise, and how do I deliver on that in the best possible way. 
week four, first act, week five, second act, week six, third act. And it's as simple as that for the actual days that you'll be, or for those classes. It's like, you if you're writing half hour, you have to write 10 pages a week. If you're writing full hour, you write 20 pages a week. That would be about four pages per weekday. Two pages per weekday if you're just doing half hour. So you can see how it's just less typing and thinking to do if you're writing a shorter show. Um, so your first draft would be complete by October 7th if you follow along through the program. So you have this sort of extra week of week zero that gives you, you know, seven weeks total from today before you will have your pilot completely done. Um, feedback is not included in just the boot camps. There would be too many students to give feedback to. So if you want to get feedback, but there's ways to get that for free on the server. You can participate in a script swap. We have swap events once a week. We have table readings where you can sign up to have your script read and get feedback on it from the community. Um, if you trade with someone, you're always going to get a better obligation from them or more consistent obligation than if it's, you know, just saying, hey, somebody please read this and, and help me out. If you help somebody else out, they're more likely to help you out. And there are many ways of just finding ways to get feedback and finding ways to get readers. Um, if you want to buy a consultation from me, you can do so on the website, which is scriptcamp.net slash coverage. Members get $100 off, so they get a huge discount on this. Um, so uh, if you want that extra layer of professional feedback, you can buy it for myself at the end. It is not required, and it is not like you get a grade or anything. So it's not exactly like, a, you know, you're not turning this in for an, for a grade or for an assignment as an assignment at the end. You will try, try to get the boost that you need to finishing this, even if you don't necessarily finish the script. In the timeline of the course, we want to make sure to just set you on that right path and give you that extra push forward so that you can finish it on your own, maybe in your own time or maybe even in the next boot camp if you want to attend a following one. All right, how to enroll. So you're going to want to go to scriptcamp.net slash classes to get the course on its own or slash membership to start your free trial for your membership. That comes with two weeks of unlimited access to everything that we do on here, um, except for the coaching. But so it gives you, you know, any lab you want to go to, any boot camp, any class, any workshop. So sign up for that free trial. If you want to enroll but you haven't done so yet, you can vote yes in the poll in the chat. So make sure to click on that little... Um, uh, the word bubble icon on Discord, and uh, you can find the poll that Nacho has posted. So if you just scroll up a little bit, you can find that there. Um, go to yeah general chat and scroll up, and you can see some numbers at the bottom of the screen. Make sure to click one for yes, you want to sign up. You can also vote no, not sure, or questions. But if you do that, you will get instant access to all of our exclusive chat channels and the video library, and um, you will just become a boot camper right away. It won't charge you right away or anything, don't worry. But yeah, sign up, scriptcamp.net if you want to get that access right now. Um, okay, uh, any other things to add, Nacho, before we move on? Uh, no, just let us know if you have questions. Awesome, thank you. Nacho is our co-founder who also teaches a lot of the weekday classes, Wednesday, Thursday, and runs other workshops and things on the server. Um, so, uh, we can maybe just ask, but first, before we go any further, into sort of just what are your goals as a writer? This the script camp is here to focus on putting you on the path to becoming a professional Hollywood, you know, TV or screenwriter. Um, but people approach this for many reasons, and may, many have different, um, uh, approaches here, or they're trying to do this for different reasons. Um, some people want to direct movies or TV themselves. Some people want to be an actor and they want to write stuff for themselves to perform in. Some people want to write, you know, one man shows for, or, um, you know, short theatrical performances for themselves to put up at a fringe festival or something like that. So, um, we are really geared towards that and uh, the, the professional Hollywood track of doing this. Um, but no matter where you come from, there's always going to be some, um, some good reason to practice and to learn more and to improve your craft. So, Feel free to chime in and tell us what is your ultimate goal. Do you want to write on a staff? Do you want to write features? Do you want to direct your own movies? And tell us about what is it, what it is that you're trying to get, and maybe we can give you some tips and some early guidance in how you might approach that. Feel free to either unmute and speak out loud or use the chats, the text. Anybody want to tell us about some of your goals? Hi. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I, I've always thought about why I really do this, and uh, maybe it would be great to be paid to do it, or uh, it'd be great to be a director or to make a film, but ultimately, you have to be a slave to the screenplay if, if you want to venture in any of those directions. 
and uh, I always feel that you know you have art, and art goes hand in hand with craft. And the, what what this uh, what your program is about is really the craft. Mm-hmm. And I think unless you master that craft, you're not going to be taken seriously. Even if your work is a little bit maybe mediocre, but if you've mastered the craft where you hit the beats and you know how to manipulate the writing to create emotion. Then at that point, perhaps some kind of serendipity will occur where you will meet somebody who will see the same thing in your writing as you do, and you'll allow yourself to get a break. So this is just merely the absolute starting off point is to get really good at writing a coherent story with acts, with, uh, you know, uh, turnabouts and uh, good endings and... uh, then other opportunities will uh, arise. So what I'm really getting saying is that I just really enjoy just the act of writing. If that leads to something greater in terms of a career, so be it. But uh, I'm almost uh, tethered to uh, the uh, act of writing in order to move on. It's a paradox, what I'm really trying to say. So that's what I have to say. All right. Yeah, thank you for that. I totally agree. You're you're 100% spot on that. It's that first step is to get really good at writing. And it's almost silly to worry about any of the other steps. How do I get an agent? How do I get a manager? What color is my Ferrari going to be before you just do step one, which takes a long time to just get really, really good at writing. And sometimes it might take some time of feeling it out for you to figure out what am I actually really good at? What am I best at? Maybe I'm not the best of pilots. Maybe I want to write features instead, or maybe I want to write short stories or something like that so it will take a little practice and a little you know it's that it's why we send kids to you know do to to school to do a general education is to figure out like what are your interests what are you what do you have aptitude for so putting in that work early on and approaching this as like you have to climb that first hill of just getting really good is so so super important to approaching this the right way thank you for the comments gary um, we have Malcolm on our, uh, I think, YouTube uh, stream who says, staff writing is my goal. That's great. So, yeah, this is if you want to be a staff writer. Of course, as I just mentioned, first step is become obscenely good at writing. But then there's this other sort of whole track that you can approach to in staff writing where you can go the assistant route, meaning you will have to move to Los Angeles and start networking with other assistants and with people who want to become assistants and people who are working in the mail rooms of agencies and things like that. And you can, through connections, you might be able to get a... Uh, writer's PA job or an office assistant job that can move to writer's PA that would be the, be able to then move to writer's assistant which could then maybe move to showrunner's assistant which then would move up to staff after that. So that's its own whole sort of route. I'm not an expert in that just because I didn't do that myself. The only TV show I've written on was an anthology show that I didn't, I was never an assistant so uh, I didn't go exactly that track. But um, yeah, in, when you finally get that opportunity for yourself and when you're finally getting those low-level TV jobs, they're going to eventually give you the opportunity to be like, all right, show me a script. And when you have that chance, if your script doesn't blow them out of the water, then you might have wasted the chance. So even no matter the route that you're going to become a staff writer, still the first step is going to be overcome, you know, climb that first hill, fight that first dragon, which is get really, really good at writing pilots. Also, if you aren't already reading tons of pilots and you want to be a staff writer, start reading three pilots a week. Anyone else want to weigh in with their goal or uh, questions about how they might reach that goal? Oh, sorry. You have a little quiet. Go ahead. I can hear you. Go ahead, Jojo. Okay, cool. Um, I just guess, like, <clears throat> you want to get into directing you're saying i think i can i think i'm hearing you say you so directing your own features is that right oh you muted yourself i think he i think i heard him say he's he wants to direct uh features so um yeah that's uh, that is going to be its own path like starting as a filmmaker might be the case where you want to start ma- by making short films and then making more complicated short films, and then sort of assembling your own crew that you're going to be working with consistently. 
um, and the writing is going to be important, but it's not, if you're directing yourself, it's not like you will always have a committee of people who are going to tell you exactly what to do with that. If you're sort of steering the ship and making those independent films for yourself, you will have a lot more control, but it's also going to take a lot of work and a lot of um, probably personal investment of money and time, and you're going to have to learn how to finance films, learn how to be a producer, basically, as well, to some extent. Um, unless you have crazy great connections, then you're going to have to do a lot of legwork yourself to direct your own movies. So, for the most part, people will want to start with shorts, either if you're, you know, depending on the realm that you're working in, comedy or drama, short films or maybe sketches, or if you want to work in, if you want to make horror films, horror shorts are really, really big online. So, there's always going to be sorts of, like, um, ways to break in as a director that will diverge a little bit from the path of someone who just wants to be a writer, but at the same time, um, you will still be called upon to pitch and to do a lot of the things that you, as a someone who is just a writer, would need to do. Um, you'll have a little more freedom as a director to kind of do what you want, and if you want to write weird, offbeat, difficult, challenging, or bizarre things and have them be made, then directing them yourself is probably the best way. If you want to write more studio films that are going to be perhaps a little less daring and a little less art house, but will make a crap load more money than writing studio features is probably the, the route to go down. But you can always transition from one to the other over time. Like you can start as a director and then get writing gigs or start as a writer and then eventually push to direct your own material if you're, you have some early hits. Thank you for the link, Nacho. There's a, a link right there in the chat to lots of pilot scripts that you can download because what you should start doing is reading three scripts a week in the kind of genre that you are interested in. Um, and uh, every week during our script camp meetings, we I always ask, what have you read recently that you want to tell us about? And there's no discussion questions or test answers there. It's just so that you keep reading and are paying attention and taking notes and just learning things. So start reading and bec to become a great writer you must become a great reader there's no exceptions any other goals or um uh, uh questions about how you might achieve some of these goals um in writing careers that you guys want to ask now okay we'll move on for now but let us know in the chat questions if you have um more ideas or things that you want to do that you want some guidance on how you might get there so this pilot will be finished in six weeks and i say this in every boot camp will this be good no probably not and the goal is not for it to be amazing the goal is not for you to knock it out of the park especially if it's your first script is it going to get made how am i possibly going to get this on tv don't worry about these questions and don't worry about any individual script needing to be good whatever good even means this is like going to the gym you wouldn't go to the gym and be like oh i i don't i wasn't so good at lifting those weights i'm not sure if i'm going to come back and lift more weights it's like no you will only increase your you know strength and improve your form by going to the gym again and lifting more weights the next day don't ask me i don't actually lift weights at the gym but you you get the idea this is the sort of thing where it's like did you do a great job? Who cares? You should be going back to the, you know, going back the next day and lifting them again. So don't worry too much if this turns out amazing. And you're going to want to probably pick an idea that you're not incredibly attached to for this very reason, for the idea, for the reason that you have only six weeks. It's a very, you know, limited amount of time in order to do something as complicated as this, especially if you're new at it. Um, so maybe pick a newer idea that you're a little less invested in because then you won't be as attached to one version of how those events should go. If you're working on some an autobiography or your father's life story or something that you care a lot about getting right or doing all the research and making sure that you get every fact correct and you have a perfect picture of how it's supposed to be, it's probably not the best choice for a boot camp script. A boot camp is best for kind of um, ideas that are fresher and wackier or stranger. Um, you, you can't think I'm going to try to get this made because that happens so, so, so infrequently. So maybe just pick something that's exciting for you and is interesting for you. You've got to just make sure that you are going to be motivated enough to finish this in six weeks and keep coming back and keep typing at it more. It's not an easy thing to do. So if you're spending more than six months on any one script and you're not being paid and you're not going to direct it yourself, you might just need to change up your process because in the professional world, writing a script in eight to 12 weeks is more or less expected, at least for that first draft so try to adjust your process so that you can be writing a script every 12 weeks or so i know life gets in the way and people have families and jobs and all these things that I, it's totally understandable but uh if you want to do this for a living try to write be writing at least three to five scripts a year um if you're writing half hours double that um but you know for features or hour longs three to five of them a year should be what you're aiming for for the most part 
you got to write the bad scripts to get to the good ones, though. So don't worry if your first one doesn't turn out really well or you think that you ruined that great idea. You can always try again with the same idea later once you've learned more and once you've sort of gained more of these skills and lifted more of these weights. Um, and you can always, you know, put something in a drawer and come back to it if you really want to rewrite it later. But just don't be too attached to a script. One of the most important skills that writers have to work on is the, uh, screenwriters have to work on is the skill of simply letting go and moving on from projects that you can't do anything else with that have fallen apart or that are just not working out. Letting go is a skill to improve and one of the main things that we actually do need to work on. The skills that they don't tell writers to work on but they actually are skills that you need to work on. Letting go, taking notes because you're going to get a lot of feedback in this whole job. Screenwriting is not a solitary form of writing. It's not the kind of thing you can do entirely in a basement or an attic by yourself without anyone involved because a movie is a company that employs more than 100 people and moves millions and millions of dollars around. It is intensely collaborative and you are not the boss of the whole thing unless you're a very influential director or you know um, something like that, the executive producer on the project, something like that. But for the most part, this is a collaborative form of writing where you're trying to sell the idea for a script to somebody and you're going to give them a version of what that script could be and then they're going to get to choose what to change about it. Um, and then the actor's going to probably be able to make some changes on the day, and the director's going to make some changes, and then in editing, they might make more changes, and whole scenes that you've written might be moved around or cut out, and you have to get used to this. If you want to be writing movies on a studio level in the U.S., anything that's not just for you and your own team to make, that would be you know, a very bootstrappy, independent film. If you're not doing that, then you're answerable to a lot of people, or you know, you're answering to a lot of other people. There's a lot of other cooks involved and it's usually going to be between two and four or maybe even five or six people who are going to give you feedback and changes and notes and just things that they want to see in your script that you are kind of responsible for adding, removing, or changing to make the best possible version of it. Because when you're a screenwriter, you're kind of not just the guy who writes the initial document, you're the script department. And so it's your job to keep everyone else on board and on track and make sure that no one's getting confused or lost. And if you're on a staff, to be able to collaborate well and speak and interact socially with this group of people that all have different backgrounds and different experiences and just be very social and very good in a room. Being good in a room means that you will be able to have great interactions with other people. You're not annoying. You're not talking over people. You know when to be quiet. You know when to hold things to yourself. You know how to incisively cut to the heart of an issue and deliver a diagnosis or notes on it, things like that. So... These are challenging things. Being a TV writer is really, really hard. It's really difficult to do this. And you have to want this more than, you know, most things in your life. I'm not going to say more than having a family or more than any of these things, because you can still have a family and, and do this. You can still have, you have to have another job to support yourself while you're getting started doing this. So these are all understandable, but writing on a professional level in America, meaning you're getting paid enough to not do anything else, requires a significant investment of your life. So get used to this idea this will be an uphill road that will take years and the only way to get better at it is to do lots of practice so we can make a sketchbook now um go to your google docs uh and open up a brand new blank document and just call it name of your movie if you have a name already sketchbook or just call it movie sketchbook or sorry tv sketchbook pilot sketchbook whatever you want if you don't at the top you're just going to start gathering the basic information whatever you already know if you're like i know the title and i know what the genre is now i need to work out the rest then you can put that at the top right now um, you don't have to if you don't if you aren't sure yet, but just start filling in things that you know. And through the course of the class and through every class, you should have your sketchbook open and be working on it and be adding things to it while you're listening to the instruction and other people talking about their ideas and things like that. You should be modifying your sketchbook as you go and just participating actively in that way. Um, it's you know you, there's no actual rules. There's no one who's going to say you can't be on Instagram or playing Minecraft while you're doing script camp classes. But my recommendation is that you be have the script, have your sketchbook open and be adding things to it and writing down questions you have and modifying the first working version of your logline and trying to improve it and just be working as you are in class. Um, so I'm not, I haven't defined what all these things are yet, but just make that sketchbook. It's going to be where you keep all the sort of unsorted ideas for your entire script as you are coming up with stuff. It's like a collage of all those um, ideas for characters or lines of dialogue or the premise for the show or rules of the world or settings that they go to or anything like that that is going to come up, links to videos or pictures that will be important for your research materials or books or um, you know any embedded imagery or documents that you want to include that you think will just help you. There's nothing, nothing wrong can go in a sketchbook. It's to gather and collect and collate all of your early pre-writing and research information. So 
make that blank document and just start filling a couple of these things in. <clears throat> I'm going to grab a ball of water and give you guys like 15 seconds to do that and to um, start collecting information. I'll be right back. So hopefully everyone has made their sketchbook document for them to start collecting that early pre-writing and research information for the document you'll be working on. I'm going to pause here and just see if we have any questions on anything we've talked about so far. Anyone, everyone totally clear on what we're doing and where we're at? And I'll check the text chat too. Sarah Bell says, a scrapbook of ideas. Yeah, you can think of this as a scrapbook of ideas. This is like your, you know, your 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 big macaroni colla art collage where you have uh, pictures taped on there, you have lines written on there, you might have a few video links, um, you might have some art that inspires you, or um, maybe audio recordings or anything like that. Just keep it all in one place. We don't want it in a bunch of separate scattered graph paper notebooks or anything like that. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I'm going to uh, keep going here. So, um, ground rules. What kind of idea should you be choosing for the TV pilot class? Um, just some guidance to make sure that you are going to write something that you can effectively finish in the boot camp. None of these are really, really, really ro like rock-solid rules, but they are based on the experience that Nacho and I have had of doing this for... Uh, quite a while now. We've done a lot of these programs and we have seen the kind of things that we have just watched students struggle with again and again. So just trust us on these. Don't do true stories, anthologies, rewrites, or adaptations. We have a separate course for rewrites that you can let us know if you're interested in. We can try to start a new session of that. But for the purposes of this class, I would write something brand new and original because it's so much easier to do if you're especially still piecing together the basic skills of how to do this. It's going to be easier to do this rather than unravel and untangle something that you are like a flawed document that you already have. Um, it's always going to be easier to just write something new. Um, don't do time travel. Uh, just believe me, it becomes almost impossible to keep straight on the page very quickly unless you're going to do a very comedic sort of hand wavy version of it where we don't have to worry about the rules that much or it's like i don't know at the beginning your character goes is an alien that travels back to our time or something like that we just don't want to have the majority of your notes be i don't understand who that is or what's going on in these scenes or aren't those clear paradoxes or we have different understandings of the basic rules of you know recursions and time loops and things like this um you just want the most of your notes to be about the characters and the scene work and these things that are like just easier to respond to so if you're newer at this especially, don't do time travel. Trust me on this. Probably don't do a historical unless you already have a decent amount of foundation in that era or that particular place that you are writing a script set in. Just because it takes so much research to, to accurately portray a different time. And so, you know, you, if you're writing a story that was set when you were a child, like, um, you know, in the, in the time of your childhood, that would be one thing because you clearly have a basis in that. Whereas if you're writing something set in 1300s Ireland and you don't have any idea about even the basics of how that society or culture works, you probably don't want to do that because you only have six weeks to write the pilot and it just will often require that extra touch of research for that verisimilitude and authenticity that fans of historicals are looking for specifically. So probably don't do one. Just be really careful with anything that's hard to keep straight on the page like clones, parallel universes, anything with multiple copies of the same people running around montages and flashbacks or excessive use of montages and flashbacks unless the entire structure of your show is based around them i wouldn't recommend i would recommend against them and that's a really advanced technique to write a show with like branching timelines or like um sort of uh flashback structures that are essential to the skeleton of the plot or things like that so if you're in doubt just don't do one of those the easiest story to tell is going to be start at the beginning go to the middle proceed to the end we don't want to be having to draw diagrams to understand your story 
especially if you're just not familiar with the basics of what does writing a coherent story look like on the page in script format. If you're working on those things, just don't do any of this crazy stuff. But this is a good time to just take a big swing and write something weird. Write something fun and crazy that you think would never get made. I think it'd be awesome to write a Western about a guy who has to fight giant snakes. Um, I've written a few versions of this idea. I'm pro am I ever going to write the whole movie? Probably not. It would be so expensive. This would be like so prohibitively difficult to make a giant snake movie that I'm like, forget it. But it's fun. And for a boot camp, I might pick something like that. That I'm like, well, that would be never made in the U.S. But I would love to imagine that that could be real. So I'm going to use that to sort of hone my skills as I go through this. Um, if you don't have an original idea, so maybe just pick something that you've never seen before. Two genres that you like but have never seen combined. I love action movies, and I love um, historical romance, but I've never seen historical romantic action. Maybe think of some way that that could possibly make sense, you know? That could be just a really good way to excite and entertain yourself as you're going through this, and also keep that distance where you're not that attached to how it turns out because it's not your masterpiece you've been working on your whole life. It's not an autobiography. It's not like you have to get every fact correct or you'll be in trouble. It's just a story that gets, gets you excited and keeps you excited. Um, after this class, you should use your real name in boot camps, uh, just because that's how the industry works. We're not using screen names in the industry. I, a pseudonym is a different thing where if you always write under a different name, you can use that. Um, but just don't be using screen names after this class. You can keep a screen name for the, the purposes of this session, but after this session, Make sure to use either your real name or your nickname or something that is the name that you will want to be using that is a real name. Um, so any questions uh, before we go on to TV writing basics on ground rules? This is something we don't get into until we get to structure. I will just add this is sort of a ground rule too. The options for your time slot are half hour or full hour. And there's a bunch of different formats we sometimes see, like uh, Adult Swim cartoons, which are sometimes 15 minutes long, or maybe even 10 minutes long for like web cartoons or things like that. Or sometimes you'll see a pilot for a stream, a show on Netflix that's like an hour and eight minutes long, something along those lines. But for the most part, the pilot format is half hour or full hour. No questions about ground rules and types of ideas to pick? All right, if there's no questions, we'll keep going. So um, basics of TV writing, I'll go through this pretty quickly just because we want to make sure to have enough time to get to working versions of log lines. So during, as we are working up to the second half of class, you should be using your sketchbook to, first of all, remember to collect all your ideas, all your just fragments of sentences of what this idea is and what this is supposed to be. What is the genre here? What are the, what are the main characters here? Um, what kind of action are they taking part in? What are the conflicts? What are the locations and settings and rules of the world? all these things but moreover um you should be working on just try to try to work on this one sentence expression of what the series is and we'll get more into log lines in, in just a couple slides here but if you already have an idea of how this works maybe you've taken other script camp programs you have already a, a little bit of a basis in how log lines work something like that you can always just be noodling around with that until we get to the review portion which will be in that second half of class probably around 10 to 15 minutes after the hour so um there will be a chance for you to get that direct feedback and also to speak out loud and explain more about your idea and answer questions about it. So don't be shy. Screenwriting, TV writing requires tons of social interaction, especially TV writing. This is one of the most social forms of writing that there is, especially if you're going to be on a big staff show like a comedy or like a uh, sketch or late night TV show or think something like The Daily Show. Then uh, you have to be extraordinarily social quick in the room good at improvising and like improv and riffing off other people's ideas and getting along well with everybody and just these many many super social skills and pitching and explaining and articulating your ideas sometimes we'll hear from a script camp student somebody will say something like well um i know it's all there i'm just not very good at articulating or i'm not just i'm just not very good at explaining what they are and that's our, our job is to be good at articulating and to be good at explaining you can't be a runner and be like well i would have run the race but i'm just not that good at being fast <laughs> it's like well that's the job. That is that is what we are purporting to be experts at by saying, I'm ready to be a professional writer. You're saying, I can clearly articulate and communicate my ideas with no real struggle. You know, it's not, well, not that it's always easy, but I can, I, I don't get tripped up. I can, I can think of something and pitch it in a presentable way very quickly. You have to be fast. You have to be social to be a TV writer. So be ready to speak on the mic and to clarify 
and to answer questions in a, you know, not, we're not, no one's fighting you or no one's debating you. It's just a non-combative way, be able to take the notes and work with them and say, thanks, I'll see how I can work with that. And just um, be kind, be engaging and be engaged. So um, the showrunner is at the top of a TV show. That person is in, ha- in charge of both writing and production, and they are the heart and brain of the show. Without the showrunner, there is no show. Not to say they can't get fired. They can get fired and replaced, but without them, there's nothing. There's nothing going on. There's no boss. At the, there's no one at the wheel. Um, the staff consists of staff writers. That's actually the lowest level of writer, um, and uh, they are a little quieter than you'd think. It's like the staff writers, mostly their job is to sort of listen and learn how to rise through the ranks to become higher-ranking writers, Writing producers are the people a little higher up in the hierarchy because in TV, producers are writers. You should just know this. Producers are writers in TV. Don't forget that. So they're all overseen by that showrunner. So the person at the head of the room, that's the one calling the shots, determining what the episodes are about, axing or accepting and approving ideas and directions for these different story arcs and things like that. They are the show. And the staff writers are there to support the higher level writing producers and to do that kind of grunt work um, as they rise through the ranks. So, number of staff writers can vary a lot between different shows. On certain, like, limited series and drama shows, they can be just maybe one to three writers. It can be just... The showrunner can be the sole writer, depending on how it works. Something like True Detective will have, like, Nick Pizzolatto is the guy who writes True Detective. That's just, for the most part, how it works. At least for season one. In seasons two and three, I think they may ha- have had a, a, a smaller staff. But you can see how, especially in the UK model, the showrunner is just the person who writes everything. Now, smaller staffs will be, like, drama or limited series or miniseries shows um, with a more singular voice and with a more limited area of focus, something like Fargo, which is, like, mostly a Noah Hawley show with a couple staff writers, or something like Black Mirror that's, like, a Charlie Brooker show with a couple of these interchangeable staff writers and things like that, Um, all all the way up to 15 or more writers, up to 20 maybe sometimes on things like Late Night, um, things like, uh, you know, um, Daily Show or, or, uh, you know, Ferguson or the... Uh, Craig Ferguson or these late night talk shows or late night comedy type political shows Samantha Bee things like this comedy writers rooms are bigger than drama writers rooms um, comedy really the, the the idea is that when you're all in the same room together the energy is just different and when you put a bunch of funny people in a room together you end up with a bunch more funny material to work with um, so that's why TV staffs are moving back towards being not as much based on zoom and things like that moving back towards being centered here in Los Angeles the feeling, whether this is true or not for everybody, is that when you are in the room together, ideas just fly freer and you get better results and better, more engaged writing. Um, so whether you believe that or don't, you do sort of have to think in your career strategy, when am I going to move to Los Angeles if I want to be a TV writer in the U.S.? The answer probably shouldn't be for several years if you are just starting writing now. So unless you want to go that assistant route, and, and if you are going that assistant route, I will suggest... It is helpful if you are in your, uh, let's say, 20s or 30s, don't have a big family or a lot of career obligations or things like that, because you will be working very long hours um, for, you know, very difficult, stressful, uh, difficult and stressful conditions. And it's not for everybody to go the assistant route. So um, if you don't want to be the assistant and move up through the ranks towards staff, you don't have to move to L.A. right away. Take your time. Become really good at this first. Uh, spec. What does spec mean? S-P-E-C stands for speculative, like a speculative script. Um, it's a weird term that refers to several different things. In features, a spec refers to a script you've written on your own that you've not been paid for or commissioned to write. It is just a script that you had an idea for, that you wrote and own all the rights to and all the characters to. It is not fan fiction. It is not something that is um, you've been hired by somebody else to do. It's for the purpose of getting you work in some way, maybe to get that spec bought and produced in theory or it might be a writing sample to sort of focus on getting you management or getting meetings and not really caring if it's going to sell there's many results you can get from it but that's what spec means in features in tv spec means two separate different completely diametrically different things a spec episode is like a fan fiction episode of an existing show that's currently on the air there's not a lot of reasons to write these um you write them mostly nowadays to enter a few different fellowships and contests that require them and maybe some showrunners like to read them as part of a portfolio but the emphasis nowadays is on original pilots and it's seen as that is the most indicative type of thing you can write to show off your voice on the page your command of structure your ability to create story and situations and then resolve them in a satisfying way that doesn't feel like we're leaving anything out so being able to write complete original pilots for theoretical shows that don't exist 
on their own is actually the main skill of being a, a t or to work on to be a TV writer in the U.S. Um, so a spec remember spec episode is like fan fiction episode of a show that exists. Spec pilot usually just called a pilot. That is going to be the original first episode of a theoretical series that does not exist and almost certainly will never exist. You're going to use that mostly as a writing sample to try to get reads and meetings and to enter contests and fellowships. So don't be thinking, how am I going to produce this? How am I going to get this made? It's not going to get made. Don't worry about that. You want to write something that is going to build your skills. You're going to move on to the next thing and write another thing. And you're going to move on and move on and move on. That is how you get better at this. So um, I talked about this already, but um, basically you can move to LA and be an assistant. Or you can follow the other track, which is just get really good on your own. Build out a good portfolio of pilots and maybe other things like features or web shows or stand-up. All of these things can be scouted, too, for TV writers. Sometimes producers are going to um, one-man shows or one-woman shows in New York or in Los Angeles, and they're looking for interesting voices and people that come from interesting backgrounds and have something to say and have an interesting way to say it. Think of these people like Diablo Cody, who it's like, I think she was working at a strip club for a while when she was scouted as a... a, a well, she was a, a successful blogger before that. But it's like people with an unconventional take on the world or some kind of um, interesting point of view or this, this is all really valuable in TV. Diversity is really, really at the heart of what makes someone really employable in TV today because having that different perspective from the norm or the majority is seen as really, really valuable in the room. Um, also, though, your writing is going to be the thing that makes or breaks you. So you have to be really good. Just because you come from a different background doesn't mean you will... It might get you in the room, but it doesn't mean that your writing is going to get you the job. So focus on the writing before you work before you worry about anything else. But do think, just what is unique about me? Um, me, myself, like, I, when I, I'm thinking about these things, I'm like, well, what do I bring to the table? I'm a straight, white, American 29-year-old. What do I possibly bring? Well, I went to Quaker school for eight years. Like, there's something there that not everybody knows about. So be looking for something that you've got access to, some tradition or culture that you come from, some religion, up, something in your upbringing, or the land that you were raised on, or the skills that you have, or the hobbies that you have. Anything can sort of make you stand apart and read as somewhat more valuable to in, in staffing terms. So um, don't discount the things that set you off and make you different or give you this different um, point of view. Um, and uh, think about how you can use them to your advantage when you are moving into towards the like meetings and uh, like staffing type part of your career. Again, don't need to worry about that until you become obscenely good at writing, which takes up to 10 years for most people. Um, so the, the process of uh, getting those meetings is like, you'll have to get a manager first, meaning you'll win or place highly in contests fellowships and other sort of accolades and um, events like that, as well as just network and be meeting people who work in TV and movies, so probably have to move to LA for this. You will then, once you get that manager, be able to have your manager submit your portfolio or you know individual scripts in the portfolio during staffing season to these showrunners that are looking to fill out their rooms. If you really uh, impress them with your writing samples, you can get a meeting with them, then you have to really nail those meetings, and then theoretically you can get staffed based on that. So you can see there's a lot of steps. It's a really, really difficult uphill climb to become a professional TV writer in America or a screenwriter or any kind of person who makes the, all of their living from writing. So just embrace that and know that and be ready to tackle that. If that sounds intimidating for you, it's okay. It should. It is intimidating. It is difficult. But uh, it shouldn't make you turn away. If it makes you turn away and say, actually, maybe this sounds too hard, it may not be the career for you just because it doesn't get easier than this. I'm down, I'm down, I'm like... I know it sounds very doom and gloom in some ways. I'm also downplaying how difficult some of these things are. So you have to expect that it's always going to seem overwhelmingly difficult to do this. And if you are the kind of person who will succeed at this, you will hear that and you will think, oh, well, I have to do it anyway. I just have to. This is the only thing that I can see myself doing. Um, I'm willing to invest a significant portion of my life to just getting really good at this. Questions on TV writing basics? All right, no questions. We'll keep going. Uh, so um, there's a couple of reasons why you, might, why you might want to write a pilot, usually because you want to be a pro TV writer. You might also just be writing it because you just enjoy this as a hobby, or you might want to get more skilled at this craft. Um, or maybe you want to direct a web series yourself or a pilot yourself um, or a stage show or yourself or something like that to sort of get started as an actor. These are all possible things, too. 
and in TV, writer, star, and uh, like writer, showrunner, star is much more common than it is in features. So some think somebody like Donald Glover, Jerry Seinfeld, Phoebe Waller Bridge, any of these people that have like a show that is them, they are the show. That is a viable thing to do here. You also have to be a great performer, of course, but you know, it is a, it is a way you can go about this. If you want to direct, writing pilots is probably not the right way to go unless you are doing web series, in which case you can actually just make those as like, you know, five to 10 minute long indie series, basically, um, where you can do whatever you want. But uh, if you want to direct, you should be making short films and then trying to move up to features. In TV, directors are more like hired guns that are brought in like uh, as needed to serve the showrunner's vision, but directors are not in charge in TV. Um, so in any case, we'll just sort of sum this up by saying, don't worry too much if any one brick in your road that you're building is a masterpiece, and any one big brick being any one script. No one script is should be the thing that you put all of your hopes and dreams on. You have a long road of these that you will need to make, so put one down, start on the next one, put one down, start on the next one. Just think of it like that. You must approach this as if it is a craft. Like you're not, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the human soul. We are making chairs and tables here. You are, uh, I, think, I forget who says this, but you're chopping wood and hauling water. Um, and uh, yeah, think of it like that. Okay, so um, let's look at the overview of the whole process. Um, we start with logline. Logline is one sentence that tells us what is the series about? That's the series logline. We have a pilot logline, too, that says, what happens in this episode? Um, every show or every theoretical pilot that you guys are writing will have two loglines, series and pilot. For a feature, you just need one. For a book, you just need one. Um, for a play, you just need one. But for a show, you have to have a sense of what is the overall journey that we're on here or what is the sort of repeatable set of situations that we're getting into week after week. And then you have this question of what is this first episode of TV about? The thing that you, this is usually produced before the rest of the show would be made at all. So you're trying to get people on board to understand what the story will be and, and sort of get the appeal of this. They can see what the show would be from just reading the pilot. They shouldn't have to read all your supplementary documents like show Bibles and things like this. You don't have to write those because if the pilot's not good, no one's going to read a Bible anyway. Um, so we have logline first. Figure out those one sentence that each things or you know expressions of the idea that tell us uh, what are some of the main plot points going to be, what kind of experience are we getting in for, and what are those basic promises that you're making that it will then be your job to fulfill over the course of the story. We then move on to sketchbook, which you should have open and should be working on. Like we talked about, you should be adding things to the sketchbook even right now. Um, but the sketchbook is your collage of all your influences, your scrapbook with you know. All of the pasted in uh, Polaroids and the little stick figure arts and all these things like that. Think of it that way. You need to start just collecting and collaging your influences and ideas. Um, next week, or sorry, in our week two class, we will go into story beats where we'll really talk about structure. You don't need to worry about structure way too much right now. You can have it in the back of your head maybe, or maybe you've taken some other script camp classes so you kind of know what the general shape of three act structure looks like because that is at the core of Western storytelling, three act structure. Um, whether you're writing half hour or full hour, um, those three parts, you know, beginning, middle, end, that's gonna be the foundation of how we're organizing the events that occur in this fictional narrative. Um, we move from story beats to scene cards. Scene cards are gonna be an expanded version of the story beats that is gonna tell us what pages that scene is anticipated to take place on. So in essence, you are giving an estimate of how long each of these moments will require to play them out to their, you know, to their full potential. So if you're not great at that right away, it will just require you doing it several times to figure out, well, what kind of moment requires more or less pages or how, how many pages would I require to pull something off? So don't worry way too much about getting it just right, but the essentials are we wanna figure out what happens on every page um, more or less before we get to writing it all. So that's gonna be about, we start with the story beats being two to four pages long and your scene cards are going to be five to ten pages long for most people we are then going to go to pages go to pages is an industry term that you should learn and know and use go to pages means you move from outlining to actually blocking and staging scenes on the page and writing dialogue and figuring out how this would actually go like from moving from this planning stage to the executing stage and um that we say we say that we say go to pages have you gone to pages on this when would you like to go to pages things like that so that means that you are in the thick of it you're in the weeds and you've moved on from your planning and now you are 
focusing on in the second half of this class all on that execution of the idea. So, um, shall we talk log lines? Um, any questions before I go into log lines? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. When you said the director is not the boss on a television set, mm -hmm. I mean, what did, what did you mean by that? Yeah, so with TV, the every season has a bunch of directors that might be the same as last season, or they may be different from last season. Um, the showrunner is in charge of, like, and the, and the producers are in charge of hiring directors to take control of these individual episodes, but they're still answerable to the showrunner, and they're still answerable to the network. Whereas with a movie, the director is sort of much more the boss, the voice of what to do, and they're the heart and brain. Whereas in TV, showrunner, writers are in charge in TV. Directors need to kind of answer to the writers, and they need to serve the writer's vision. And if a director is not working out in TV, they can fire the director and bring in a new one. Very interesting. Very insightful. I never knew that. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. It's like you can't fire the director of a movie. And if, if, or if they fire the director of a movie, things are going terribly. Um, it is like going to cost people millions of dollars and set them back by weeks or months or maybe years of their development to replace a director for a movie because that person is in charge of pretty much everything. The writer follows the director's instructions in movies. But on TV, the directors work for the writers. Good question, though. Any other questions? question sure uh must must your finished pilot have those break points for commercials in other words must you put in act one act two act three or can it be just one complete 30 pages or 60 pages mm -hmm. so um you do sometimes see pilots floating around that are just written all kind of one complete act usually those are for people that already had a show greenlit at a streaming network or something like that um, so it's like, we already have a deal with Showtime. We don't need to write in act breaks because they told me I don't need to. If you're writing spec pilots, meaning you haven't written them for anybody, you're not hired to write them for anyone, you don't know where that show would theoretically end up. So you want to have it be seem like this could be on network TV, or this could be on streaming, or this could be, you know, on any venue that would take it, basically. Um, and you can, like, uh, it's not a hard and fast rule. Page Go ahead. 15, you say... Like on page 15, if it's a six, if it's one hour, page mm -hmm. 15, you say end of act one or beginning of act two or act two. You, That's you right. You have a little slug point that says that. That's right. Um, like you so, center it or to the left or however. Yeah, it's centered and underlined in, in all caps. Um, you'll see it in TV scripts all the time. So it's um, even if your show is intent, you're like you're thinking this would definitely be HBO. This would definitely be Netflix, something like that. It's good to still have the act breaks just to build that skill of where to kind of like break the tension and um you know resume it after we get back from the theoretical commercial even if the show wouldn't have commercials it's still helpful to have them so i think you should write them in for the purposes of a script camp boot camp if your show just can't possibly work with them then it's not the end of the world but i i'd say in 95 percent of cases you should be writing in act breaks yeah and the very first page is a teaser Usually, yeah. You don't have to have a teaser. You can, or like a cold open. It's sometimes called. It's sometimes, yeah, same thing. Teaser and cold open, same same term. Um, not every show has one, but if you want one, you can have one. And then the second page, right at the top, it would say Act One. If you had a one page teaser, yeah. I mean, Act One, Act One, yeah. Okay, okay. And there's four then in an hour. There's five. And, and then there's at five. the end, the end. There's going to be five. So twelve pages each, five of them total. That'll add up to sixty. And then you have, for instance, a cold open, which is going to give you, you can make it, you know, one to three minutes long. And then the stinger at the end, which is like, it could be after the credits or it might be during the credits or something like that. That's going to be, again, one to three pages long. So basically your whole pilot will be 60 to 65 pages if you're doing an hour. Stinger in, in the pilot? Yeah. So that's like after, you know, after we completed Act 5, it's sort of like a little epilogue that hints at what's coming next week. Sometimes some shows do this like, the characters are talking over the credits or it's like a scene after the credits or something like that. But often this will be suggesting what's, what is the threat that's going to be deal that we're going to be dealing with next week. Or sometimes in a comedy show, it can just be, you pick two fan favorite characters and they're just sort of hanging out in the stinger. Um, yeah, but you have, you don't, you again, you don't need a stinger, but if you want to have that little extra one to three page scene at the end, you can have one. I would think that since this is, uh, just a one-off more or less until somebody takes an interest in it you mm -hmm. putting a stinger in it is going to be like real presumptuous and stuff right no so the thing with pilots is that 
we in fact need to be writing up uh writing it with the sort of expectation that like this could be a pilot of a real show even though we're in our mind we're like i'm never i'm not gonna get a real show i know that but it, it if it the pilot doesn't feel like it could support more episodes after this then it's not a successful pilot and that's like part of the weird thing about writing pilots is that it needs to feel complete on its own and like a satisfying little journey but at the same time it needs to feel like oh i would watch more of these i would tune in next week and that's how you get someone excited about a show. It's like, it's not only was a good story on its own, right? Contained on its own. But I also could see, I can imagine where this might be going. So it's no one will see it as presumptuous if you suggest what's coming next week at the end of your pilot. As long as you don't start thinking, yes, I know I'm going to get a show. Or, you know, I know I'm going to get more episodes. Just um, writing it in is totally fine. And the, the teaser will say teaser at the top, underline, quotation marks? Either teaser or cold open. And you have to say it. You can't just start because it's understood that the first page is always going to be that, right? Right. It is, but well, so not every show has a teaser, I guess. So you can just start with Act One if you want to. Um, but t- in TV, you you label every act, even though you know we we know where they, what they will typically be. You start with cold opener teaser That's at the standard, end. You write. Uh, yeah. Standard formatting for that kind of business. That's right. Okay. Okay. Good. Good questions. Thank you for that, Gary. Um, any other questions on these? Uh, some of these fundamentals of TV writing before we uh, move into log lines more. All right, no other questions. Let's look at log lines. So, uh, log lines. You have to have two of them. One for series, one for the pilot. I would write that down at the top of your sketchbook if you've not already done so. You know, series, colon, pilot, logline, colon. And then maybe start figuring out what this might be or writing down ideas for these. You often will have to go through a couple different iterations or versions of these before you settle on the final one that you're going to be going with. But um, this has to do a couple things. Um, We want to be implying visual action and make it feel like this is not going to be a story about people just sitting around thinking about stuff or considering stuff or discussing stuff or all these non-dramatic ideas. We want to make sure that we're going to be watching people do stuff and we want to know what we're going to be watching people do. Um, We want to know who's the protagonist and what do they want? What's standing in their way? What happens if they fail? Um, So the two types of log lines will have a little bit, uh, some differences between them. Series log lines a little bit more general. It doesn't have to have as strong of an emphasis on this person needs this thing by this time. It's more like you describe what we might consider to be the story engine, which is another really important key idea in TV writing. What is a story engine? Well, a story engine is not one single thing. It's like a combination of all these different factors in your show that make it feel like, I mentioned, we want to feel like it feels, uh, we want to give the impression that there's tarmac to, or road to go on after the show is over. Like, after this pilot has ended, I want to feel like, oh, I can imagine another episode centering on that character that would explore that funny um, concept in your sitcom. Or maybe you're like, I can see how it will take multiple seasons to solve a mystery this complicated and this big. Or, um, you know, it's going to be a combination of the conflicts between the characters that you have, the plot elements that you have in place, and um, just the ways that those are suggesting um, a, a series of potentially unlimited stories that can bloom in the reader's mind and create this vision of this TV show. So a series logline is supposed to sort of convey the story engine. It's saying, like, this is going to be, this is the world that this is set in. This is focusing on this world and this intriguing character that inhabits it. Um, whereas the pilot logline is a little bit more brass tacks. It's more like a feature logline. It sort of says, when the inciting incident occurs, an adjective protagonist must conflict or else stakes. That's sort of our basic format for this. It doesn't have to follow exactly this every single time, but these are the questions that we generally want to be answering with each of our loglines. So and these are the questions that might occur to your reader and you might get right away if your logline doesn't answer these. So with the pilot logline, um, we want to know the inciting incident. What is the thing that sets the story in motion? And we'll get way more into what each of these things mean and how they work in our structure day, which is on week two, so two weeks from now. But inciting incident is that that event that occurs that kicks everything off, you know? When aliens invade Earth and, we, we, you know, adjective protagonist, let's say uh, an alien-loving soldier is... Um, or I, I, Why would he be loving aliens if aliens just invaded? Let's say... Uh, a soldier that hates aliens is forced to become a diplomat to negotiate peace between Earth and the aliens. Something like that, right? Where now it becomes clear why, oh, okay, it's about that person going on this journey because that person has some kind of really intriguing 
conflict or some kind of contradiction in how I'm describing them that implies that they're going to lead us to interesting situations. If your main character is a soldier who hates aliens and he's forced to become the diplomat to negotiate peace with the aliens, we can see how that might be particularly difficult and an ironic journey for him to go on. He's going to learn that using your words is just as important as using your missiles and your guns and things like that. That would sort of be the implied theme by just having that be the setup of your character there. So you want to be picking each of these things carefully. Don't just pick the first adjective that comes to your mind when you are describing your character. If it sounds like just a description of that type of person uh, writ large, then we won't really be that interested for the most part. Think something like, a determined detective needs to solve a crime. It's like, well, we expect a detective to be determined, so that didn't really tell us anything. In fact, you kind of have to be determined to be a detective. Or think like, a protective mother needs to save her kids. It's like, well, and I know not every mother is protective, but the expectation in terms of a story is that a parent is protective of their children. You aren't really describing that character better or more in depth by adding that word. So pick your adjective carefully. Pick your adjective su to suggest why this will be difficult or ironic for the main character to go through this series of events. Um, do we have a question? Oh, I just heard a mic sound. Never mind. It may have just been background noise on someone's mic. No big deal. Um, okay, so this is the pilot logline. When inciting incident, an adjective protagonist must conflict before or in order to stakes or ticking clock. Stakes are, why do they have to do this? What will happen if they don't? So he needs to negotiate peace with the aliens before they destroy the world. That's the stakes. Life and death of everybody in the entire planet hang in the balance of that conflict. A ticking clock could be anything. It can be just some device in your story that is forcing urgency to the situation because it forces your characters to act and to accomplish their goals before a specific milestone or time <clears throat> so it might be think it can be as uh, literal as an actual bomb with um, you know we need to your character needs to figure out how to defuse the bomb before it goes off that would be a very literal ticking clock or it could be something like you know our pilot episode of our sit of our teen sitcom is going to be they throw the kids throw the best party ever in the first act and then they realize mom and dad are coming home and they only have one day to clean up all the mess from this huge party before they're in total you know huge trouble and they're getting grounded or whatever so that's the ticking clock for that story. It doesn't mean it has to have the intensity of a bomb all the time. It could be anything. It could be, you know, I need to get to the bank before it closes is a ticking clock. And it might just be helpful to clarify in your logline if we're lacking that sense of motivation and urgency, what is causing the character to have to act, you know, by this certain time or in this certain way. So let's look at some series loglines. Um, I've already gone over sketchbooks. Um... So, uh, in a TV logline, you're going to have to choose if you're doing... There's two different types of continuity in, in the TV world. There's premise shows, and there's status quo shows. A premise show is like a very long movie, like Lost, like Ozark, like Breaking Bad. These are like a very long journey that you're going to watch the first chapter of in the pilot. And then a status quo show is something like law and order or something like the simpsons where you can pick up any episode and you're never going to be confused what's going on in csi because the setup for the show is enough for us to know oh they are crime scene investigation people that solve murders um you can watch them in any order uh relatively you know there, will, there might, might be very gentle gradual plot arcs or progressions for the characters or things like this but for the purposes of a pilot a status quo show is going to deliver a really clear beginning middle and complete journey and then it's going to feel like, okay, this takes place in a world that I haven't fundamentally broken by the end. You can't break the world at the end of a status quo pilot or else we're not going to get what the show is. You know what I mean? If you're going to do a show which has a cast of nine characters introduced and they all die at the end of the pilot, then we're going to be like, wait, what's the show? How is this a status quo show unless you're doing something where it's like a cartoon where we might understand that every episode has sort of completely separate continuity between them where we don't have to even worry about that kind of thing. But very few shows do that, so... You want to make sure with the status quo show, we're telling a complete little microcosm. This is like an example of what the, the sort of conflicts and, and thrills and fun that we will have on the show from week to week. Um, but at the same time, um, we leave things relatively intact so that we realize, okay, by next week when I pick this up, I will be able to fully understand what's going on here. Questions on that main difference between the, those two different types of continuity structures in TV writing? No, no, I understand that. I have a different question. Uh, sure. Does the uh, 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 the act headers, can they break in the middle of the page, or they have to be at the beginning? 
In other words, your last act acts ends halfway in the previous page. You mm -hmm. wait until you start the next act at the top of the uh, next page. Or it so can break right in the middle. You can't break in the middle. So TV writing is um, really strict about some page stuff. Um, because TV is like, you know, it has to fit into a really clear time slot. Unlike a movie. A movie doesn't have a time slot it has to fit into. Um, but for TV, so you, you want to make sure that you're making the most of every page. So that you're filling out your acts all the way to the bottom. And you write end of act one, act two, whatever, at the bottom of the page. Because you have to go to, down to the next one before you start the next act. So if you just bring it halfway down to, to you end your act in the middle of a page, you have to leave the rest of that page blank. And then move on to your next act. So it's like you wasted half a page. Make sense? hope that answers and that go ahead and the indicator that the act is end it's like a slug line it's to the left it's centered it's underlined and all caps and it says end of act one spelled out like a c t o n e okay 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 thanks for the questions other questions on premise and status quo shows and maybe what kind of show yours would be Um, we'll look at uh, some genre stuff. Actually, let me do this. I want to see how many people want to work on a logline today, or even if you have a half-formed, not very good one, that's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect at all. This is Remember, this is week zero, so don't worry if it's that good. I just want to see how many we might have to work on today so I know how many other slides I can do before we start doing feedback. Why don't you go ahead and post what you have in the chat? So go to click on that. You see where it says general chat. Mouse over that and click on that little white word bubble, and you can bring up the chat on the right-hand side of your Discord window. And you can paste in from your sketchbook. You highlight and copy, highlight and paste into here. Whatever it is that you had for your TV idea for your log lines so far, it's OK if they're not good. But let me just get an example of, or let me get a sample of how many I'd want to look at today. Um, anyone who has anything for the show, go ahead and share it with us. Give us like five minutes to write something. I haven't written one yet, but I have an idea. <laughs> okay, it's okay if, if you don't have anything ready to go yet. Um, then okay. uh, yeah, don't worry. I just want to get a sense of who has one that's even like partially formed. We're gonna do much more of this next week, so you'll have a whole week to to work on this before we go really deep into it. I just wanted to see if we had anything to look at today. Anyone have a partially formed logline they want to share with us? It's okay if the answer is no. Also, if no one has these, we can just focus on info and craft stuff. Oh, Haley has one. Okay, great. Anyone else? Okay, maybe just one for now. So uh, we, we will look at that, um, but I'm going to do about 15 more minutes of uh, slides first, though, if we only have one to work on. But also, if before we get to the sharing portion, if you have something to share, then go ahead and paste it in chat. But we'll look at Haley's. All right, thanks, Haley. Um, so let's do a few more slides first, and then we will do that. So let's aim for, like, in 15 to 20 minutes, we're going to um, review that and anyone else who's been posted by then. So um, genres. I think we all have a pretty clear idea of what genres are, at least in our own minds. But, like, genres are just how to categorize what goes on what shelf in the video store. Wow, that's so ancient. It's to determine what goes on what, you know, what streaming network, what goes on what heading of the streaming network. It's how people organize the kind of emotional experience that they want from something. Because I always say, real life is kind of too many things for us to collate and categorize. Like, as what is it, Lovecraft says, the most merciful thing in the world is the inability of the human mind to correlate all of its contents. So you have to think, like, real life is too much stuff for us all at once. You can have horrible things happen to you, and good things happen to you, and okay things happen to you all in the same day. And people don't really know where to file all that stuff. And so when we come to entertainment, you typically want one type of emotional experience from that entertainment, even if that includes a kind of a broader range of types of things that you'll see. Like, you might say a dark comedy is going to give you, uh, you know, darkness and comedy, or like, you know, darker topics and comedy. That's sort of, you know, those are two separate flavors that when combined together sort of become that one flavor of, of dark comedy. Or you might have something like, you know, um, any, any combination of two of these. So... We don't want to mix up more than two or else it's just going to start confusing your viewer and they aren't going to know what it is anymore. So try to pick your two most pertinent genres and express it as a combination of those things. Um, we know the basic ones, and this is pretty much a list of your options. There might be some crazy things on here that I just don't really have in mind or maybe aren't really prevalent in the American market. There might be some things in international markets that aren't really genres that we have on TV as much. But let's look at the basics. You got comedy. 
that's going to be everything from your sitcoms to your dark comedies to your, um, you know, crossover with drama a little bit into dramedy. We have drama, which is, um, you know, it could be a lot of different things. Um, but these are some of the biggest shows on TV, especially when drama is combined with another genre, like something like Game of Thrones is a fantasy drama. So we can express almost anything on this list as just a combination of two of those things. But it's, there's nothing wrong with having just one genre. Big Bang Theory is a comedy. How I Met Your Mother is a comedy. You know, a sitcom, which is the subgenre of comedy. Some shows might have five different genres that might theoretically apply to them, but we have to pick the most pertinent and relevant ones. Because we're trying to tell the audience what kind of experience are you getting into. So something like Supernatural, I've only seen a few episodes of, but it, you could almost describe it as any one of these things from a week-to-week basis. But for the most part, we're going to say it's a fantasy mystery thriller show. Because that's, like, most of what we're doing here. It, it Does it have scary scenes? Yeah, now and again. But is the primary emotional appeal that it's going to be scary? Not really. Um, does it have crime in it? Yes. Is it the crime genre? No. Does it have dramatic and funny moments? Yes, but it's not a comedy or a drama. Supernatural is, like, basically a fantasy, mystery, thriller type show. Monster of the Week is the kind of status quo format that it's going to be using. So boil it down to two. Don't pick a bunch of genres to match together or we're going to be really confused um, I might have a few that haven't been, like, Western is a genre on its own. I haven't really listed on here because your Western will probably be either a drama or an action-adventure type show. Maybe you have a great idea for, like, a Western horror show or, like, a Western sci-fi show or something like that, which we'd, we'd love to see. So if, if it's not in here, don't feel like you can't write it, but just don't mash up more than two things. Um, we have procedural. Procedurals are going to be... Uh, I've only ever seen them in live action. I guess theoretically it's possible to have a, a, an animated procedural. Maybe there's even an example of this that I'm not thinking of. But these are almost always going to be status quo based shows. Remember, you can pick them up in any order and watch them, watch them however you want. Those are often going to be focused on an institution or a job of some kind. Police, medical, legal. Um, sometimes you'll see something that feels like sort of detective procedural or... Maybe even some shows have like a borderline sort of like superhero procedural type element to them. But for the most part, these are going to be based on a job. Um, fire fi- There's a lot of firefighter shows nowadays or emergency responder shows or things like this where it's like we know the kind of business they're going to get up to every week. And we're watching because we like the people that are doing that sort of thing. So the focus there is really going to be on entertaining quirky characters and people that we will want to keep coming back for for years and years. Um, Grey's Anatomy, um, House, these are medical procedurals. We have Law and Order CSI, our crime, or like, you know, investigation procedurals. Animated shows can be any genre, um, but the expectation is going to be that they will be half an hour long in either comedy or action adventure. It's going to be either, you know, your Family Guy or your Justice League um, or Teen Titans or, you know, there's animated half hour kind of action superhero type shows. There's plenty of those. They, it doesn't have to be those things. You can write an animated script or a live-action script. They look identical on the page, um, for the most part. Uh, but you will be, you know, you have a lot of freedom there. But if you say a show is animated and it doesn't, it doesn't fit into what we expect it to be, we might sort of just be like, huh, I wonder why they decided to make that kitchen sink family drama animated. I can't really see how that improves the show at all. So don't just pick this randomly. Pick it because you have some kind of very specific vision for what the show would be. And... Um, for the most part, you don't even really need to specify unless it feels like they wouldn't be able to picture this unless it was animated. Then you might be able to tell us somehow that it is going to be animated. But generally, don't really worry about this too much. You're not going to get a show made probably, so it like whether it's animated or not, um, just uh, you write the script the same way. Okay, questions on genres or what your genre might be or what any of these genres these shows on this screen might be. I have some questions in the uh, chat I'm going to scroll up and find. So Joe Tool says, I'm struggling to come up with an engine instead of a feature-like logline. Well, that's okay because um, TV shows need both. We need the feature-like logline for the pilot. And then for the series, we want to just be- pull the focus out a little bit, pull the camera away, and give us an idea of like what are the types of conflicts that will be going on in the show. So think if you're doing like a status quo show especially, there will be a very distinct difference between your series logline and your pilot logline. And it might be something like, you know, the the patriarch of a family, um, you know, tries to keep the peace in a neighborhood filled with, um, I don't know, people with very divided, people on different sides of a war. 
that might be the status quo comedy that we're writing. I don't know. That doesn't sound very funny, but <laughs> you can see how it's like describing a type of situation. And then the pilot might be something like, you know, when Jeff gets in a fight with uh, Abram, his neighbor, they now have to have an arm wrestling contest to determine who gets the uh, to hold the barbecue this week. So we're giving like a specific example of the type of conflict that you described in the series logline. My show that I just pitched sounds ridiculous and nonsensical, but hopefully you get the idea there. So you can come up with either or both, and you'll have a full week to work on both of them before you have to actually share or get feedback on them. But um, the story engine should become clear if those elements are there. Basically, if an engine isn't clear, it becomes like really obvious to us. So um, don't don't worry way too much about this until uh, until you have if you only have one type of logline or the other, focus on the one you have and make it as really as strong as an uh, as, excuse me as strong an idea as possible, and then um, then go from there. Uh, okay, so um, other questions on genre or anything we talked about so far. All right, no more questions for now. Let's um, just do a, a couple more slides, then in five minutes we'll look at the logline that we have here. So let's look at some examples. Series loglines. Um, and this is, I was just talking about, this is a way better example than the one I just gave. Um, Blackish, a black family man struggles to gain a sense of cultural identity while raising his kids in a predominantly white upper middle class neighborhood. That's a story engine. All the story engine stuff is right there. We have a main character and a sense of what the central conflict at the heart of all of the episodes will be gaining a sense of cultural identity in a place where he is of the opposite, you know, or I should say the dif a different race to the people and, you know, background to the people that he just moved in around. That's going to be at the heart of all the episodes of the show. And then for the pilot logline, you might say something like, you know, when Joe moves into his new house, he gets in a dispute over the leaf blower with his neighbor, Jennifer. And you're just going to give us an example of, oh, okay, this is my specific story that takes place in the world I just described. Ooh, all right, um, I'm getting a little lightheaded. Um, so uh, you can see some other examples here. We have Breaking Bad and Ozark, which are two very, very popular crime drama shows um, in which uh, we have we still have a main character. We still have um, the, the primary situation that is kicking off here. And um, we have the, the basis of the conflict. Interesting world, interesting character. We don't necessarily need to know the event that kicks everything off. We don't necessarily need to know... Um, you know, the, the time frame that this will take place in. You can be a little general. You can be a bit more, uh, you can be a bit broader and more, have the camera be pulled a bit out. Um, questions on series log lines? I'm gonna turn on the air conditioning real quick. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay, we'll look at um, pilot log lines. Um, that has this a little bit more of a, there's a template you can use with this. Again, not every script has to follow this template exactly, but these are gonna be those main questions. And we want a better sense of motivation, stakes, and urgency for your main character. What is kicking this off? What obstacle must they face or overcome? What happens if they don't? Or what is that ticking clock that is pushing us through the story? It reads a little more like a movie log line. All right, um, so uh, that's all I really wanted to do in slides. I have a couple more we could go through if we just have the time. I wanna make sure to leave more room for questions and discussion at the end, but I'd like to look at the log line that uh, was posted or any others that you guys might have that you wanna share. Um, and let's uh, give some feedback. Are you here, Haley? I am. Awesome, all right, so let's talk about all over. Um, can you tell us about this? Yeah, so it's a dark comedy of um, it basically a 55 and over community where um, it kind of breaks all the stereotypes, thinking that this is going to be a quiet, you know, community, whatever. And um, this woman moves in and realizes instantaneously that it's not. It's like being back in high school, and but everyone is just old and um, their bodies are falling apart and people are dying. And but uh, it's got it's all the same craziness as high school. You've got cliques and gossip and everyone wanting to sleep with each other and all this stuff, but in that environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a um, uh, a solid basis for a sitcom 
type show, I feel. Um, when you say dark comedy, did you, you intended this to be more of a sitcom, or do you see this as sort of like a, um, uh, is this going to feel more like a single camera, like dramedy kind of vibe, or how, what, what like, guess, do you see this I on FX, meant, that kind of thing? Um, yeah, so I, this, to me, this is, you know, we're, we're swearing, we're, um, it's loud and bold and, you know, crazy and wild. Um, but I guess when I said dark comedy, I guess more just because we're making fun of mortality and illness and disease and, mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff within it. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. So I could see this on like an FX or an AMC type network or something like that. Um, let's look at the logline. So an active 55 plus community that acts like, so we want to avoid repeating words when you can and saying active and then acts like high school is sort of repeating that word a little bit. I would just, um, okay. when you, when you can try not to do that, that acts like high school with horny wrinkly bodies and where most will not make it out alive. Most will not make it out alive. So the idea being that some of them do leave because their families just transfer them somewhere else or something like that. Um, I guess I was just trying to imply that because of their age, that this is where, you know, the people around them are going to start dying or that that's just part of the cycle of life and being that old in this place. Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of trying to imply the, I guess, the opposite. But I didn't want it to be like they were in prison there. I just, Wait, the, you know, the just well, like, the opposite. Well, hang on. The opposite would be no one makes it out alive. When you say most will not make it out alive, that makes me think. Wait, some of them do. <laughs> so, well, I, so I, I mean, I don't know. They're they're not there. You know, they have free will. They can move out. But... I, I see what you mean. I, you don't want to make it sound like a thriller. I, 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 right. I get it. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. Um, but so an active fifty-five community. So even in the series logline, I would still um, suggest who the character is or the, who who the main character is. Um, so, okay. uh, just saying something like a family, it, we want to usually be able to frame that around a person when you can think of who is the main character and still suggest who this is for the logline. So you would say something like, you know, a newly widowed woman, uh, you know, struggles to fit into a 55 plus community, something like that, where st her struggling to fit in is going to be, that's the basis of all the episodes. So think of like, what is her main conflict with them? Is it struggling to fit in? Is it, um, you know, trying to adjust to some very different culture that's there than she's used to or something like that. We, we want to give the suggestion of what is the conflict we're going to be watching from, from episode to episode as it pertains to the main character. So just give us a little sense oh, of, of the main character. Okay. The so Go ahead. maybe you, maybe you can help me with that. Cause my, yeah. my immediate thought is we see her move in. She's there for like two minutes and then she goes down and asks to be released from her contract to move out. And they're mm. like, you signed a contract. So she's like, let me out, you know? And so in my mind, she doesn't want to be there. Like after, you know, it's not what she thought it was going to be. And yet, so she's kind of surviving or trying to relearn or I don't know, back, you know, back to that kind of chaotic atmosphere. So is this the kind of place where no one would go voluntarily? No, no, this is just, it, it's just not what you think it's going to be or not what she thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, she wasn't expecting the drama and the, you know, getting like the high school kind of mentality mm -hmm. to be at this stage in her life and be surrounded by it. So it sounds like you need her to be stuck there, right? Yes. So what are some reasons you would be stuck at a community like this? I don't actually know that many details about it. Do a lot of them have physical disabilities, for instance? Could it be that she has had an injury or some kind of condition that requires constant care? Um, so the, the my mentality, so to me, this 55 and over is an active community. So no one would have anything that made them physically that they would need care constantly. Um, mm -hmm. And that would, to me, I have in my head, I have, you know, visuals of just, you know, crazy antics. Again, something you'd see like a high school kid doing that, mm -hmm. but you're seeing a, you know, 70 year old doing, which makes it ridiculous and mm -hmm. stupid, but it's kind of funny, you know? Um, okay. And so, uh, I mean, there's reasons to be stuck there. I mean, for one, for this character, it could be that she doesn't want to go, you know, move back in with her daughter or she doesn't have, you know, somewhere to go. She doesn't want to be alone. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, there, there are reasons, I guess, I can come up with. I think the one thing that is going to help you the most is a central relationship. Um, because in a situation okay. where the character doesn't have to be there and could leave at any time and is maybe paying a lot of money to be there, um, yeah. and there's not a physical reason why she must be there, then it's got to be because there's someone there that she can't part from or that she needs okay. for some reason. Because that's going to okay. be the, the easiest thing to, for the audience to, to 
understand. If it's like her best friend just moved here and her best friend has been like, you've got to move in with me for, a, it's great. It's not like you're thinking at all for a long time. Right. Then that's a great reason for her to go. Um, and a great reason for her to not want to leave because there's someone that I care about that lives there. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. So some, some guidance I'll just give everybody is if you're, str especially in drama, if you're struggling to find why the show is happening or what the rules are or what's going on, find the central relationship and you will find the show. So that might change the series log and I, to say something like, I don't know, when she joins her own elderly mother in, a ret in like, I don't know if you want to call it a retirement community or whatever, but like, I don't know, maybe her, one of her own parents is getting older and she's like, oh, I can help take care of them. And also, I don't know, they said it sounds, it's kind of fun. Maybe it is. And so if she has like a parent that's there, it's like, I have to be there to take care of them or something like that. And then that relationship will give you just tons of kindling to burn for the rest of the series. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. All right, let's look at Pilot. Um, a newly widowed woman, that says women, woman, woman, woman. A newly widowed woman moves into a new community. Again, we have new twice. Is it a new community? It's not newly established, it's only new for her, but if you say someone moves into a place, it's always new for them. So, unless they've lived there before. I would just say moves into a community. Uh, or into, into, I would describe it like retirement community. I'm not quite sure how you would, what you would call these places. 55 is not that old, so I'm not even sure like how, what these things are uh, referred to as, but whatever it's called, just find the term for it. Moves into a blank community, hoping to find peace after staying with her daughter's family. Why is that relevant? After staying with her daughter's family? Um, I was just uh, kind of putting it into why she's wanting to move there and then is kind of stuck there. That was kind of I was using. Oh, okay. So um, I would take that out for now um, and try it. It seems like you're still working a little bit on why she's there. So when you have that, then update it accordingly. Um, yeah. And uh, Amelia, what, what a woman moves into a retirement community. We're hoping to find peace, comma. Only to have to defend herself against spitballs from denture-wearing neighbors and gossip from the geriatric gossip mill. Uh, so we have the word gossip twice as well. But I like how you've given us specific examples here. Um, and if you can hint again at that central relationship in a pilot, especially in a drama like this, it's like, remember, for a pilot is supposed, or pilot logline, it's like, here's an example of the type of situation, or of like, here's a, one of the many situations that we can get from the premise that I just described to you. So it might be like, when a newly widowed woman moves into a, this retirement community, it turns out her neighbor is a crazy spitball shooting weirdo who acts like a five-year-old. And now she needs to resolve that difference before she can get settled in. You know, how we just give like a little bit more of a granular view of what the specific conflict is for the purposes of this first hour. Okay. Okay, so yeah, specificity will, is much more important for pilots. So I'll say specificity. Um, example of maybe who is the antagonist? or, um, you know, uh, main, uh, you know, main interact actions, whatever. I don't exactly know how to say this, but we're the, we just probably want to mention at least one other person in one of these. Um, okay. And then after that, yeah, I like the way these specific examples. Let's defend herself from spitballs from the neighbors and gossip from the, uh, the community. Um, and then once you have that last piece of why she's specifically here, I think the rest of this will all click into place. Questions? Thank you. Questions from Haley or from anyone? No, that makes sense. I appreciate it. Thanks, Haley. Uh, and you have some, some, looks like some folks have listed some suggestions in the comments as well. So. Feel free to take a look there. Oh, some other folks posted their log lines too. Good. We have 20 minutes. I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes each to talk about these and to answer some questions and get some early feedback and guidance. Um, oh, I think we've had uh, somebody else just posted theirs too. Um, I may not be able to get to everyone today. We do have to end on time today, so I won't be able to stay after for the class, but stay in Script Camp and use our chat channels and you can get that extra feedback even if I don't get to you. All right. I'm going to try to get to as many as I can though. So let's start with... I guess you would read this as, is it Maria uh, for The Way? Yeah, yeah, it's Maria. Hi, Maria. Um, you want to tell us about this show and read out your logline for us? Yeah, so the series logline um, would be a sheltered college student fights to succeed in the perilous Bronx neighborhood of New York City. And the pilot logline would be 
When Audrey's grandmother died, she must take on the responsibilities of reforming the neighborhood, taking care of children while also coping with her own internal struggles of maturing and self-discovery in the heart of New York, the Bronx, but the dangers of the city don't make it easy. All right, thanks for that. Okay, so is this a drama or a crime drama? No, this is like a dramedy. Oh, dramedy. Okay. Yeah. Dramedy. Got it. All right, so let's look at this again. So series logline. A sheltered college student fights to succeed in the perilous Bronx neighborhood of New York City. I think everyone knows where the Bronx is, so I wouldn't mm -hmm. use the words to specify the Bronx neighborhood of New York. It's like the Manhattan District of New York. We know I mean, yeah, there's only yeah. one Manhattan. So <laughs> a college student fights to succeed in the Bronx, basically. Why is it so perilous? Is this set in modern day? Yeah, so I live here right now, and yeah, it's pretty perilous. Why, why do you say so? So there's just like a lot of like gun violence, gang violence. Um, a lot of people are talking about like making it out or whatever, and not a lot of people do. You know, it's just not like not an environment where you wanna um, you wanna raise your children. But mm -hmm. it's like home to me, and I feel like this show can like kind of like bring a new light to the um, neighborhood because there's also good in the area. Mm -hmm. So when you say yeah. shelter, do you mean she's from an upper class background though? Yes, she is from an upper class background. She's moving from, I want to say, a wealthier state. I didn't um, specify the state. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But so so she is from an upper class background and she's coming to go to college in the Bronx. Is that right? And is it because they just have a school there that she really wants to go to or something? Why, why does she choose this area? Yeah, so she, the idea I had in mind was she's taking a semester off to take care of her grandmother. Oh, so do you see how when you say a college student fights to succeed, we're thinking, oh, so she's struggling to succeed at college. But yeah, the, fact yeah. that she, the fact that she's a college student if she's on a vacation doesn't sound particularly relevant to the story. Right. So you might want to describe her in different terms. This is, and, and you can think, you can, you can describe the same person with several different words, can't you? It's like, you might describe somebody as a, an exasperated, uh, you know, um, postal clerk. Or if, if that's relevant to the story, right? Or if the story is about their home life, you might call them, you know, a, uh, a, 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 a depressed widow, right? It's like, that's the same person we just described in two different ways. So if the central relationships are more about like her family life and it's not really about her schooling or her job, probably don't describe mm -hmm. her as a college student. You would say something like, I like the word sheltered, but maybe just think of a different word that you might use there. And then when you say fights yeah. to succeed, I would define what you mean by fights to succeed. So fights to, um, I mean, how? W guess I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what is she trying to succeed at, and is it just fixing her family life? Because you said you described it as people are trying to get out of poverty and crime in the Bronx, right? That's what's so difficult about it. But if she's already rich, yeah. she isn't struggling with those things, is she? No, I imagine her to have like a savior complex. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So what is she trying to succeed at? Is just the uh, a question that people will be wondering here because we're wondering yeah. what, what the conflict is that your character is, is engaging with. So in your series logline, you might want to mention, like, again, the central relationship of the show. Is it the grandmother? Or the, I'm sorry, she's died. So is, who, who would you call the central sort of relationship of the show if you had to pick? If, it's okay if you don't know. I would say it's the main character I'm describing here, Aja. Mm -hmm. So her relationship with her family, her brother, oh. her boyfriend, what? I guess I'd say her relationship is the people she meets along the way. But she has family here, right? Yes, well, only her grandmother. Oh, she doesn't have any family oh, survivor? Aunt. Oh, she has an aunt? Okay. Is that, do you think, a character that it plays a major role in the show? Yeah, I call her an antagonist. Oh, an antagonist. Okay. So I guess in your series logon, I'm, I'm a little bit wondering how you might want to describe what the show is because you have a character who's not in school. She's on break. She doesn't have any family there. What is she actually trying to do is my, is my question. Um, so just yeah. really clarify what she's trying to succeed at. What is her actual goal? And it, for the series, remember, it can be a little broader. It might be like she fights to get her family out of poverty. She fights to, you know, or she's struggling to... Um, save somebody save her brother who's an addict and trapped in a gang you know just pick something tangible yeah. that we can really understand oh i get what we're going to be doing in the show um and that we can sort of picture a little better make sense yeah yeah that makes sense so frame specifics of conflicts um or i'll just say frame uh conflict a little more clearly 
What's standing in the way? I liked how you mentioned there was an antagonist. What's standing in the way? Um, and then the pilot logline. All right, is this, is it Aja? Is that how you say it? Yeah. Okay, when Aja's grandmother dies, comma, she must take on. So there's a little pronoun confusion there. We don't mean the grandmother when you yeah. say she. Um, so when you when you say two characters of the same gender in a row and then you use the he or she word, we're like, the grandmother or, or yeah. Aja? So usually a better way to do this is when her grandmother dies, Aja must, see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that makes more sense. Okay, must take on the responsibilities of reforming the neighborhood. Why does she have to do that? I guess it's just like a realization, like towards the, the end of the episode, everything she's seeing, she wants to kind of like save it or like help it. Mm. So her grandmother was doing this before? Yes. Okay, idea, so yeah. was her grandmother like a, the heart of the community or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is good. So your logline is probably more like when her grandmother, the heart of the Bron of, of you know an impoverished Bronx community, dies unexpectedly, uh, a college student moves back home and takes over her role and needs to like you know fill the shoes that her grandmother left behind. Isn't that what you're sort of saying? Or am I way off? Oh no no yeah 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 that's that's yeah. Okay, so that way it's a little clearer. We're like she must take on the responsibility. Why? Oh, because she's taking over the you know the the space that her grandmother left behind. So really clarify that. She's taking over grandmother's role, and that's what gives her that sense of duty and obligation, I think you're saying. Inheriting sense of duty and obligation. Okay, take care of children. When you say children, whom exactly do you mean? I mean her cousins that she doesn't know about yet, that she meets. So was the grandma taking care of them before? Yeah. Oh, she was. Okay. So clarify that uh whose children question mark um so this would be something like you know she takes over her grandmother's role as the heart of the community and as the guardian of three eight-year-olds whatever whatever it is while also coping with her own internal struggles of maturing and self-discovery in the heart of new york the bronx but the dangers of the city don't make it easy so a lot of this we would assume while also coping with internal struggles is something we can think every character is going to be going through. We already know mm -hmm. that New York, that the Bronx is sort of the, like, we understand that the Bronx is a, a very famous borough of New York. I would cut most of the second line here um, and use those yeah. words to clarify and amplify what you have rather than adding stuff that we could have figured out on our own. So when her grandmother mm -hmm. dies, yeah, I would rephrase this pilot log line more like she must assume the title or must assume the responsibilities or the duties that her grandmother used to perform meaning she has to now and be specific and be some it would be something like you know she has to now um i don't know uh fix up an old apartment building before it's condemned and shut down or she needs to now you know manage taking care of these kids all the while trying to um uh, i don't know get her cousin a job something like that that's just a tangible goalpost mm -hmm. all right so a couple tips for you there any big questions on this no, I think you kind of gave me everything I need. I just want to thank you. Sure, yeah, thanks for sharing. This sounds interesting, and like you are from, you said you're from this area, so people love that in, in TV, that authenticity, and the fact that you actually know what it's like to, to, to live there, you know the kind of people that live there, you, you know what it smells like and feels like and sounds like. Having that is really valuable when writing a show like this. So if you can do something to draw from your own experience, it doesn't have to be about you, literally, but like if you're drawing from your own experience in some way. Make sure you mention that when you're pitching to people as well. Yeah. Thanks so much for this. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for one more. Um, and uh, also so make sure you scroll up in the chat. Paul has a good suggestion there for you as well. All right, so we're going to look at Jotul with, um, oh wait, I'm sorry. Gary has one that he posted first. So for anyone who I'm not getting to, you can either come to lab tomorrow. Lab is tomorrow, 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific time, and I can give you one-on-one -on -one feedback that will be much more in-depth than I'm able to in the time remaining here. This is just an overview intro class, remember? So um, come back tomorrow for lab if you're a member. If you're not a member, you can use our chat channels and swap and share logline feedback with other students here on Script Camp totally for free, so make sure to stick around. All right, let's do Gary's um, show called The List.
Can you read this out for us, Gary? You want me to read it? Okay. Yes, uh, please. When uh, prisons are empty during a war of secession, uh, secession, uh, pacifist ex-con searches for his kidnapped daughter before she is sold to bandits. Oh, okay. So a pacifist ex-con searches. Wait. So let me read this again. And this is—is is this the series logline or the pilot logline? That would be the pilot. The That's the pilot. Is a, okay. Yeah, series is the harder one for me to figure out. Got it. Okay. So, after prisons are emptied during a war of secession, meaning all the prisoners are let go? Right. Yeah, okay. A pacifist ex-con, one of the prisoners who was let go, I'm guessing, yeah. searches for his daughter before she is sold to bandits. By whom? Uh, by whom, yeah. Before she is sold to bandits by uh, the people that kidnapped her. I think we just missed that step of when his daughter's kidnapped right so i think you might want it to, to set this up it would be something like when his daughter is kidnapped in a mass exodus of prisoners or something you see what i mean like we just want to include that step uh, we missed the step where his daughter gets taken by someone um when uh a, when a, a, a deranged mobster uses the em you know the emptying of prisons as an opportunity to kidnap his daughter an ex-con must something something see we maybe just tell us who is the antagonist who the ant okay okay very good very good i will do that uh, Right, and then before she's sold to bandits. Okay, so um, is this all taking place in one city, or does this show involve a lot of travel? Would you say is this this is kind of like a futuristic scenario, right? Uh, a bit uh, vicinity, so it's not maybe southern Texas border towns, things like that. It's, oh, okay. It's, it's a secession of Texas from the rest of the United States, so it's oh, dystopic okay. and it's maybe a fantasy, but. Uh, that kind of thing and during the uh, turmoil during the uh, upheaval mm -hmm. uh, people are taking advantage of, uh, of mayhem mm -hmm. they're released from prison they go back to their homes and they discover that their homes have been ransacked and their families either killed or taken mm -hmm. and then the, the idea of the list is along the way they discover uh, like a CIA agent he, he, he commits suicide and they discover this list of these particular names or initials, and they try to figure it out, and they realize it's, it's all these high-standing government people who the uh, who have been blackmailed and are guilty of very heinous crimes against children. And because of their personal rage they experience in this first pilot, they seek upon the rest of the episodes to seek out all these people and do some event of revenge. So it's a, it's kind of like a roadrunner and a revenge movie. And, okay. Uh, that, that's my idea. Yeah. Right, right. And so, but we're focusing on this one guy's quest, this one guy's journey to get his yeah, daughter back, and, and that'll take the whole that'll yeah, take the whole season the, to do, right? Yeah, this is the initially when the prisons are empty and they go, and also he has a buddy, but his buddy is more of a reflection, not more so much the uh, protagonist. Mm-hmm. So uh, there will be two people involved in this, this, this quest for revenge. Okay. So when you don't have to put that in the log line because he's really... You don't, you don't have to, um, but if it clarifies the hook of the show, then you can and you should. If it's something like, you know, is he teaming up with someone who's super different than him, for instance? Like if yeah, a pacifist very... ex-con needs to team up with a serial killer, you know what I mean? Then we want to put that, that in the log line because then we're like, oh, that's going to cause all kinds of conflict, right? He's kind of like the brains, and then his partner is the muscle. Okay, that might be worth including. Just, yeah, think of how would I succinctly sum up the uh, the part, if it's like a buddy partnership at the center of it, how would I put that forward to clarify what the hook of the show is? So the yeah, show isn't yeah, just guy tracking down bandits to murder them and take his daughter. It's guy and this other crazy guy that's going to cause all kinds of problems need to work that, together. That, that long line gets very long and tedious. Right, that's the pro that's the the challenge. That's one of the challenges. Yeah, that's the challenge. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So consider adding central relationship. I'll write this down. Um, but if it goes, if it pushes you way over the word limit, you have to start triaging and say, okay, well, I guess this doesn't clarify the hook as much, or I guess this isn't as important. Um, your your lo your log line's a fine length now. You don't want to go way over this, but you could add a couple more words. It's not, um, uh, you know, it's not the worst thing ever. Um, so yeah, cool idea. Um, to me, this sounds more like a crime thriller than a drama, though. Crime thriller? Don't you think? Is this going to be lots of 
high intensity situations where we're on the edge of our seat life and death stakes lots of violence lots of chases lots of you know characters stalking and tracking and outwitting each other that kind of thing uh, uh in the not in this particular pilot though no but i imagine the other ones would in, involve that it's going to be where uh, uh the protagonist he's going to come up with these very uh outrageous ways to inflict some kind of moral and physical justice on these people who are are very evil and unwittingly cruel to children and his partner is going to do the actual bidding he's actually doing the dirty work oh, so maybe it's okay. a little macgyver and a little uh death wish mixed mm-hmm. in um i could see that i I think that um drama gives people the impression that all the conflicts will be primarily social um is that that the definition of a drama where it's uh... i'm not sure exactly if there's one super solid concrete definition of what a drama is but i think when it comes to tv people are going to think what are some drama shows succession right that's a pure drama show where almost there's all the conflicts are social we are sometimes you know they're sometimes very tense but it's, yeah. no one would mistake it for a thriller. The, the, st- the stakes aren't life and death. And here it feels like the stakes are life and death. Yeah, it's action. Right. Okay, so yeah, you might want to say um, it might be something like action drama or maybe action thriller, something like that. Action thriller, yeah, I like that better. Um, and just, just to make sure the audience knows what they're getting in for. Um, and some your comps might be something like the Purge movies, like the Purge meets... Um, you know, depending on uh, what we're doing in the rest of the show, you might say, I don't know, does this have like a Mad Max vibe, or does this have a? Um, you, you can be, you can have a little more freedom and pick whichever um, other comp you think really uh, makes this click on the page. But um, just some ideas for you there. Any major questions on this one? Questions from anyone else? All right, thank you so much, Gary. So keep working on this, and we'll um, we'll try to finalize it by the end of next class meeting. Thank you. All right, so we're at the end of the class. I want to just leave this open for questions, and also um, if I didn't get to yours again, if you're a member, come to uh, lab tomorrow and I'll be able to give you more feedback one-on-one. Jotul says, I don't need feedback, but can you read mine real quick to say good or bad? I mean, I can just respond in like a few seconds without going through the whole thing if you really want me to. All right, space. Make sure, sorry, just to tell everyone, be sure to vote in the poll if you plan to enroll. Yes, so click on that chat bubble, scroll on down to the bottom and you'll see a poll that you can uh, vote on. You'll see little numbers, blue numbers, one, two, three, and four. Click on one of those numbers if you want to get instant access to our chat channels. Um, and member benefits um, before you sign up. Uh, and our website, again, scriptcamp.net. You'll want to go to membership, and that's where you can start your free trial for two weeks of as many uh, events, workshops, and classes as you want, including these if you want to. So, yeah, you go to scriptcamp.net, go to membership, and you'll scroll down to where it says start free trial. Let me just look at this log line really quick and uh, respond to that, and then we will wrap up for today with any last questions. So, where, where did it go? Um, Space, Trace, uh, handcuffed together after crashing on an unknown planet during a space chase, okay? A self-righteous intergalactic officer and their rebellious prisoner there, his or her, why is it there, must overcome their differences to uncover and escape a mysterious alien force. It's a bit of a run-on sentence. I'm not quite sure I understand it all the way through. I'm going to read it one more time. Handcuffed together. After crashing on an unknown planet, I don't think you need to say during a space chase. We don't really know what a space chase is. A self-righteous intergalactic officer. So I would probably just say something like uh, police officer or like, um, I don't know, lieutenant or something like that. Whatever you need to just like reduce the words here. And their rebellious prisoner, his or her. I think you're referring to just one person there. If this is a non-binary character, that's a separate subject. But um, his or her is the most common thing here must overcome their differences. Oh wait, I think a self-righteous officer and his prisoner must overcome their differences to uncover and escape a mysterious alien force. We're uncovering it as well. We have to uncover it and then escape from it. It makes it sound like we have to go and find it and then escape from it. I would just say escape, I would cut the uncover part. All right, that's my super quick notes there. 
You posted one more I'll respond to really quickly, but then we do have to wrap up. Chief Thief, in order to reduce their life sentence in prison, a master thief must team up with the police in order to steal and protect the world's greatest treasures before the real criminals do. Nice, very clear high concept. It's very similar to something like The Blacklist, which is a show on NBC that has uh, been on for quite a while. So it feels just a little bit familiar for me and could maybe use a little sauce to make it stand out a little better, but it's a very solid log line there. So nice work with that one. Um, and again, the, the there thing, we wanna use pick his or her whatever possible. Hope that's helpful. Um, okay, so that's my super quick notes on that, but come tomorrow if you want more. All right, we're wrapping up here. Let me open the floor to just any last questions you guys have about Script Camp or about this upcoming really exciting TV writing program that's starting now and is going for the next six weeks. What else do you guys want to know before we call it for the evening? Oh, what was the what was the question? The question is, what are your questions? What do you want to know? Oh yeah. Uh, so again, I, I'm pretty sure I've asked this, but the the. The um, I guess the sketchbook is, is really just like we put in all the ideas that we have. Is it we put on we just put a bunch of ideas in there, or is it like a bunch of ideas pertaining to one solid like uh, big idea? Well, know. if you don't know what show you want to write yet, then you might want to sort of take sketches for several different show premises. If you figure out if you settle on what show you want to do, you're going to want to make a new sketchbook and have it just be about that one show. So basically, yeah, you can do either way. There's nothing wrong to include in a sketchbook, but once you start narrowing down what the idea is, you want to focus those ideas on pertaining to that one st script uh, story. Uh, thank you. Sure, thank you for the question. Any other last questions before we uh, say goodnight? I know it's quite late for the East Coasters. Here's a question from Maria. Anything we need to have done by next week? Um, there's nothing to turn in for next week, but uh, except if you got feedback today, a revised version of your log lines if you can manage it. And if you aren't sure what show you want to work on, decide what show you want to work on if possible by next week. Um, so yeah, just the revisions of what you worked on in class today. And just be filling out your sketchbook. You don't have to turn that in, but just be filling it out with ideas, with sketches of where things could go, you know, images, videos, anything that will help you, inspire you, and keep you on track. Thank you for the question, Maria. If there's no more questions, we will say goodnight to everybody now. We're looking forward to seeing you in this upcoming uh, TV writing program and many other classes and groups that we have in the server. So thank you all so much and um, have a great weekend.